the laws have been made. This is where civil society comes in very strongly. What should civil society do to push so that mental health is made a national priority in this country? Dorothy. So much, Solomon, and um, everybody in this room with all protocol observed. Um, um, again, my heart goes out to my brother Joseph. I, I must say that, you know, when you're talking about this whole situation, I kept me thinking we are all potential candidates of uh, mental health related challenges. Yes, in one way or the other. And um, I, I just looked at him and I just kept wondering again in terms of the support system how are they coping? But of course, there's always some way of managing, but um, very brave of you, and thank you so much. And where I'm starting with him is, you asked me a very pertinent question in terms of where does civil society come in? And this is just a voice of the majority here. I know there's Mental Health Uganda and all these other civil society organizations doing amazing work around awareness. Um, when Joseph was standing here, one of the things that we do in civil society is advocacy, and advocacy most times reaches the different stakeholders when you paint an image to the story. Doctor can present about the mental health act, he can do everything, but if we don't place a story, a face to the story, then we're not communicating. So the art of communication is very critical in passing the message across, and it starts with people having the bold guts to come out and speak openly, just like Joseph did. I'm sure uh, Honorable Betty Namboza has attested to that by saying, you know, she's touched by this. People do not have this information. So if we have more of champions coming up, like Joseph, and then, you know, st uh, speak to these issues, then we are starting that step. What kills us as a nation is the information package. So you would imagine, like, wonder if a lay person down there would actually resonate or relate with what the content of this act is. And, and, and because we are preaching to ourselves, we are elites in here, we have the ability to read and all, but what about this day-to-day -day person, Omuntu Wawansi, eh? who cannot actually even relate or pick out on these issues, who doesn't even know their rights, you know, or responsibilities or referral pathways, how do you help? Them. And that's when civil society comes in. One, we look at the Mental Health Act and say, what is in it for the people that we talk to, that we serve? And then we say, well, we can play a complementary role with the different stakeholders like Minister of Health, um, um, the heads of Butabika Hospital. I even have an issue with Butabika. Someone here really defined for me what Butabika means in Luganda to start with. What does Butabika mean? Pardon? Does it have like a, a connotation or a meaning in, in Buganda, like the language? Wechitaboka. Because when you're talking about mental health, I, I keep relating to these terminologies and I'm also thinking maybe it's one of the contributory factors as to why people disassociate themselves from seeking for these services. Because it starts with also branding and packaging and naming. Already there are these illusions of it's a detention center. But anyway, back to the point of the role of civil society. Um, from the perspective of, for example, Center for Health, Human Rights, and Development, what we normally do is legal and policy reviews and analysis. Remember they talked about it being repealed, the 1964 Act being repealed. You realize that most of these laws were the British laws. They had a demeaning language, for example, lunatics, imbecile, and all these things. But we are progressing to a world of human right best approach where we say that no matter one's condition, you're still a human being and you should be accorded the deserving uh, treatment that is guaranteed in the supreme law of this country, the national, I mean the constitution of the Republic of Uganda under chapter four that talks about the different laws on liberties, clean environment, health access, quality care, um, all these non-discrimination, all those are embedded in our national law. So what we do is we simplify these laws as civil society. And through our community awareness and with the help of the development partners and uh, stakeholders, we go to the very bottom through different approaches. We have community health advocates in different districts. We have uh, peer educators for young people. We have um, legal 
uh, volunteers, community volunteers that go on breaking these laws in the simplest of terms for people to know what their rights are and responsibilities. Civil society has also engaged members of parliament, not once, not twice. Right now we are going into the budget circle, but we get the budget uh, paper, opposition paper, and we analyze it and say, where is the health uh, figure here? What is it looking like and what is it trading? And right now you've drawn attention to uh, mental health, 0.7% only. Really, like when you look at what Butavika's budget looks like, uh, where are we in terms of structuring? COVID pandemic showed us that mental health is a lived reality within us. So I think civil society comes in to amplify these issues in terms of transparency and accountability by reviewing budgets and making recommendations, doing legal analysis and reviews and making appropriate recommendations that breathe in life from the human rights based approach. But also what we also do is strategic litigation. I know I was seated next to my sister, the ED of Botavica Hospital, and uh, we looked at each other, and uh, we remembered back then, like about 2015, I think, we had um, gone to court, and uh, one of our issues was on seclusion rooms in Botavica, the management of the different patients and the their state. But it only dawned on me that, you know, well, one of the issues to do with litigation is to tickle people's minds to talk about these issues, okay? Most times you may not even win or attain a positive judgment, but the essence is tickling people's minds to say there is this law, there are these rights that are being violated, but whose responsibility is it? And then we listen to the different voices in this room, we realize that it's collective effort from the different stakeholders to improve the state of mental health awareness in this country, Budgeting, you can only budget when you have the right data. So we are picking up on some of these issues that are coming out, and this will inform our work as civil society. Dorothy, thank you. I think that, yeah. It's just, and I think talking about it first is very important. Very so I'm, I'm really happy that we're having these candid conversations. I, 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 recently, I went on my Twitter account and I posted case you were going through something. Now, for those who follow me, I had about 20, 200 people responding. And I just wanted to sample out some of the responses. These are some of the responses that people said when I put out a question. Would you, and the question was clear, if, um, would you talk to a counselor if you're going through a situation? This is, what, this is what Ugandans said about that issue. But some people were talking about the level at which councillors were revealing their information to other people. Yeah, it's right here. So I asked, would you talk to a councillor in case you had an issue dealing with? And this is what people are saying. Um, yes, I would if it is a professional counselor, not those without knowledge on how to approach an issue. Um, then someone said that my problem with counseling is that I often imagine I know what they are going to tell me already. Then the other person said, counselors don't really provide solutions to issues, but help you, to, help you with the space to voice out your concerns so that you feel you've unloaded the heavy burden. Otherwise, I wouldn't seek services of a counselor when faced with an issue. I'd rather find a way to fix the issue myself. Um, and then it will end in tears for the counselor. <laughs> Many counselors just cry along with us <laughs> and don't provide solutions. These, these are comments, if you know. And then another thing, as long as I can solve it, if it's about them telling me the way, the same story using other words, there is no need to talk to them, you know. It's just interesting what people say, but one of it that really caught my attention was someone who said that some counselors give out their information to other people and tell it to, someone said, I went to a counselor and they told my information to my wife. When I reached home, it was a different story. Uh, again, <laughs> it's a thread. If you're interested to find out, you should go on my Twitter account and, and read some of those views. But this goes to speak about the quality of psych psychiatrists and counseling out there. 
who is there to provide us, um, to provide us, to, to be able to, to know that the public has quality counseling. Otherwise, people go to churches, which churches have pastors, which pastors are not even part of the counseling association. Some of them have never even gone to school to study counseling. They're just, you know, they just speak to you and soothe you. Others go to, you know, which doctors. Others just call themselves counselors, you know. So who is there to help us manage the quality of counseling and psychosocial support to the public? Thank you very much, Solomon. Um, all those issues are very, very uh, pertinent and correct. The, what we need to appreciate is that professional counseling in Uganda is very young. It's very recent. So over the years, for, even for most people when talk about counseling, they think about HIV. Now, the training for professional counselors is relatively new. I think McKinley, the first uh, batch of, uh, of professional counselors came out, I think, in 2000, 2001. Chambo goes slightly later, and then the other universities picked up uh, a little bit later. So we are talking about professional counselor, professional training in counseling uh, for not more than 20 years. And uh, considering the fact that not everyone who trains in counseling becomes a practitioner, now you can see how many are out there. So the numbers of professional counselors in Uganda is still very little, very little compared to the, the, the magnitude of the problem that you have to address. So the problem now is that uh, the, the person out there does not know the difference between a professional counselor and somebody who calls himself counselor. And now we have all sorts of counselor. We have a singer who says I'm a counselor, we have another Koja who says I'm a counselor, and then, and then some of them are so good at marketing themselves that they become very visible. Yes. And then you have pastors who call for, 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 for counseling. Now, the fact that they are th people are there shows you that there is a problem. They may be seeking uh, help from a wrong person, but the fact is that there is a problem. So, we would like, that's why uh, we've had discussion with the Hafsa and Minsov, and as she alluded to it earlier, uh, Uganda Counseling Association itself is not that old. I think I was being reminded by Dr. Vic Owens. Uh, Dr. Vic Owens, uh, if there is professional counseling in Uganda, she would probably be called the grandmother of, um, of professional counseling in Uganda. Dr. Vic Owens, uh, if you could wave at us, please. Uh, she's probably dedicated her life to counselor education in Uganda for all the years she's been here. And, and those of us who have been championing uh, counseling in Uganda are her first products as professional uh, counseling psychologists. And then we went out, we've done some good, and we created other problems also. So, but that is the far. Uganda counseling is about 20 years now. And, uh, and you can see the room is not even full to capacity. So that shows you how far we, we are. And unfortunately, in Uganda, uh, uh, if you don't create employment spaces, then you don't attract people in that space. So it, it's two ways. You want people to come and train, but they are going to ask you, where shall we go? So now, that's why the debate, the, the issues that Dr. Ifsa raised alluded to earlier, the one for regulation, uh, the one for the, the scheme of service, including uh, um, counselors in health facilities. I'm telling you that today, if we say that Minister of Health has allowed counselors at all health facilities, we shall get a lot of intake in the universities. So that's how the, the, the two go hand in hand. Now, Uganda Counseling Association and other professional bodies cannot regulate practice. We, we advocate. We, we, we speak for, we are a voice for, for the professionals, but I can't regulate the practice of my colleague. And that's why we need a regulatory council. And as, I, as we said, that's again a discussion we've had, we've had with the doctor officer and, and she alluded to it earlier. So if Minister of Health begins to regulate us like they regulate other professionals, then 
that person who is entering the space where they are not supposed to be will not be there. Because that would mean that for somebody to practice counseling in Uganda, they will have to be licensed. And to be licensed, they will have to present themselves and present certain minimum qualifications. Then in that way, those who are coming in and, 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 uh, and, and um, revealing secrets, any person who has uh, uh, trained in counseling, the first thing they tell you is confidentiality. If you forget everything else, you remember only what? Confidentiality, whatever story you've had is not for you to share. So when you hear somebody telling you that uh, I, I told this counselor my story and I found it at home, that from a professional perspective would be unethical and there are far um, ground for discipline. But then who is licensed, registered, and regulated. Otherwise, when it is space for all, then all those things are bound to happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gaston. Yeah, let's love on him. Dr. Kenneth, I just want to come to you as, as before I turn to the public and then I can come back to us to give our closing remarks. So in the, in the law, you, one of the arguments that you put out is that you want mental health to be taken to the public. And that means to health center threes so that we are able to meet them at their point of need. I just got to know today that we only have 50 psychiatrists, right? Did you say 53? How are you going to do this? Like, what is the Ministry of Health going to do to be able that we have services at the lower level, at the last level, as proposed in the, in the new act? Like, how is the ministry going to make it possible? It may look like a good law and policy, and well spelled out as you were presenting it, talking about, you know, uh, provision of health, of, of, of mental health care to the last person, you know, to, to Butabika Hospital, to all this. But is it just going to be paper? Is it just going to remain a